Uh, hi. You, you'd think that for as long as I've been doing this, I'd know when to hit to turn the button on. I thought, hey, damn. I live in a wind tunnel. How, howdy, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. And again, my name is Kevin Burke. And there is my telephone number. Please feel free. Call me anytime. Uh, and there is my email address. And I am more than happy to uh, have a chat with you if you have some questions or concerns or if there's anything I can help you with in your uh, real estate career. Uh, so uh, uh, I do have some credentials that I guess uh, authorized me to be able to speak about the subject matter today. There's going to be a lot of legal stuff flying around. Um, so um, been in real estate a little over 40 years, broker's license here and on the East Coast. Uh, and I do teach continuing education for attorneys. And so my job today is to make uh, an otherwise dry topic, uh, hopefully a little bit more exciting. Uh, but uh, we're going to be talking about uh, disclosures. And so it's kind of one of my favorite things. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see why on the right hand side, I'm really big about risk management. So uh, it's been always a, a thing of mine. Uh, I always figure I'd rather practice risk management than than do damage control, right? I'd always rather practice uh, making things okay before they hit the streets and, and before they become a problem. And so today I'm actually going to show you um, some of my templates that will, will help uh, to uh, show, you know, help to understand a little bit about what I'm talking about. So uh, we're going to be talking today about subjects that appear to be legal. I am not a practicing attorney. I have no desire whatsoever. They work way harder than we do and we make more money than they do. Um, I do a lot of trial work, mostly as an expert witness. Uh, standard of care is my specialty, uh, as well as agents' duties of inspection and disclosure and market conditions in San Diego County. Conversation today not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney. Please consult with them as appropriate. Uh, our talk today is intended to be interactive. Please ask questions or offer input by utilizing the Q&A button. I would love to be able to go hot mic, but part of the problem, hey, Jody, uh, part of the problem is, is that when I go hot mic, you know, you may mute yourself again, but then just indiscriminately, the program starts unmuting people. <laughs> so so uh, it's kind of been a problem. I don't know what the story is with that, but it happens from time to time. It's certainly Zoom is not a perfect program, but it's okay. All right. Uh, so I do look forward to hearing from you because the questions that you might ask may help me to shape the direction that we want to take in the webinar today. Uh, this morning we did a webinar. Uh, we did uh, maintaining records, reducing risk, and uh, we actually got out early, quite a bit early. So uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we took care of everybody, which is what my real goal is to be doing. So this morning, maintaining records, reducing risk. It was, a, I thought it was a good class. Uh, and then uh, let's see, uh, Dally, uh, Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you. A uh, uh, comment in the in the chat is uh, thank you for the informative webinars. I know I haven't figured out how to monetize it yet. <laughs> so, and I and I do load all of my stuff onto my YouTube website, which I don't know how to put a firewall up there. I just learned how to do QR codes a month ago, so uh, I'm probably a little ways away from all that. Uh, but I do know the Department of Real Estate watches my videos, and so uh, which is kind of fun. I got a great comment from them the other day. Uh, they approved my class. Uh, my RPA class, five hour, uh, five hours of continuing education. Uh, I'm now a DRE school. Um, this is not a DRE approved class, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, they made the comment. Uh, uh, I sent them my my run of the whole thing. And they said, we're really excited about reading it. I don't know if anybody's ever had the Department of Real Estate say they were excited about reading something that you did, but but I was really honored by that. I, I thought, wow, that is really neat. Uh, so uh, uh, so anyway, this morning, you know, back, you know, enough about me. What do you think about me? Uh, maintaining records, reducing risk, all about disclosures now. And we're going to hit it. We're going to hit it from a number of different levels. OK, so uh, um, thank you, Dolly. Yes, please subscribe to my YouTube and then that way you get the updates. So this afternoon after after these webinars uh, today are done, I have to wait for them to you know redact all the, the foul language and everything. And then and then uh, I go ahead and I'll load those up there today as well. So if you missed the one this morning, uh, it'll be available for you at that time. And and uh, and thank you for that. It's, it's just kind of my way of giving back. But but I had a. Uh, I had an individual call me on the phone the other day and, and just tell me how great they, they watched my how to read a preliminary title report. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
during the course of the conversation, I finally asked him, I said, and who are you? And, and he says, well, I'm buying a property, but my agent doesn't know how to explain, you know, the title report to me. And I went, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to get involved in that, but all right. Um, but, but worse yet, the title officer wouldn't return his call. So uh, anyway, apparently my how to read a prelim, which by the way, I teach attorneys that uh, stuff. Um, uh, apparently uh, yeah, was well received. So I am glad that I'm, I'm benefiting you and, and thank you for your comment. Um, so uh, t on Tuesday morning, we're going to be doing the TDS, the SPQ, SPQA, and the AVID. And I'm going to tear those documents apart. Uh, and I say that with love and affection. So, so what we're going to be doing is I'm going to go through each of the forms um, we probably, it's highly unlikely we'll be done early. Um, and some of these classes, I'm going to be kicking these up to the department for uh, review uh, to make them uh, for continuing education credit so that, uh, you know, you can get some credit for coming to these things. But uh, of course, then they're going to want to charge for it and stuff like that. So, but uh, we will be tearing those documents apart. I'm going to be going through those. And, uh, and uh, I got probably some stuff that you're not aware of when it comes to those disclosures. They're really good. Uh, there to help you. Uh, um, but I'll show you some of the things I've seen in the legal circles and some of the things I've seen uh, that the Department of Real Estate is looking at. So um, and hopefully that'll be good, good for us as well. Um, and then disclosures uh, in the afternoon. And at that point, we'll break into the statutory versus the contractual disclosures and the differences between the two. We'll have a little bit of that today, but, but it won't be quite as uh, 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 in depth. So uh, thanks for joining us for our discussion of all about disclosures. Um, California is a unique kind of place. So, you know, we're in California, you know, you've heard the term buyer beware, um, otherwise known as caveat vendor, or I'm sorry, caveat mTOR. You know, again, four years of Latin later, I understood what these terms meant. Um, but but uh, better yet, um, it was the caveat mTOR. I think most of us all know buyer beware really doesn't exist in California. Um, the, the, there's really more of seller beware, otherwise known as caveat vendor. So, so uh, you don't have to know a whole lot of Latin to know that in California, the requirements for disclosure are, are immense. Um, and part of it is, you know, to the protecting of the innocent buyer and seller. Uh, remember, California Civil Code was designed uh, for residential one to fours. So the, you know, the single, fa the single family detached home, the duplex, the triplex, the fourplex. And the theory at law in California is that uh, these poor people, as they're doing these transactions, need help and, and uh, somebody to protect them. And so the state reaches out and protects them by enactment of civil code. And so, um, and so that's why they only do one to four. When you get to fives, and greater, the theory is that you don't that the that they're not so innocent anymore. Um, I don't know. I've been doing this a long time, and and I find that they're not so innocent in any of the of these areas in most cases. But you know, we do our best to. You know, I just got off the phone with one of our brokers who, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, buyer didn't like the fact that that things weren't going her way, so she looked up the seller directly. I mean, these are just kind of the things that that you just figure there got to be laws about this. And so anyway, um, but uh, it, that just comes from experience. So why are they required? And again, to protect the consumer. In California, there is no buyer beware. There is, however, seller beware, uh, caveat vendor. So let's talk about some appellate cases um, that change the landscape for real estate uh, licensees. And so I want to distinguish between, again, we're talking about disclosures at the 30,000 foot level. So, you, you know, you have your, you, your superior court, which is the lowest court level, municipal court, small claims court, all that kind of stuff. But when, when someone is not happy with the outcome, at least to the superior court level, they kick things up to the appellate court level. So if you understand that, that there's been this great big lawsuit that went back and forth and then um, and and then uh, the decision was made, lots of money spent on that, um, and and a decision was made, and then somebody was not happy with the decision, then they, they kicked that up a level to the appellate court. So if you thought you spent a lot of money at the lower level, imagine how much money you're spending now. So in the appellate court, it is really expensive. And in the appellate court, their job is not to retry the case. Their job is just to, to see if there was a, an error in law or, or something else uh, that was done incorrectly um, 
a lot of times they kick them back to the superior court level. But when they come up with a decision at the appellate court level, uh, um, they make that decision. And then based on whether or not they publish the decision, and we're going to see that that's going to become important for us here today. Um, is, I mean, again, it's not a law class, but but uh, you know, if they make the decision to publish it, then it becomes the law of the land. Um, and we say that we mean California. However, the rest of the country is looking at what comes out of California. As I've always said, we have more lawyers in California than anywhere else. Um, and so, and the laws tend to move from West to East. And so, um, so that's what we get when we get to the appellate level. So, you know, if, if somebody's not happy at that level and they still have money left, then they kick it up another level to the uh, uh, Supreme Court. Um, and and then, then money is just completely out of control. So, so wanted you to be aware of that little, just that little background information to understand that, that there's a lot of money in these things. Um, and, and usually somebody who is very unhappy. So, so let's talk about the Easton case. And the Easton case was, was kind of like the, the granddaddy of all of them. It was really, it was a nasty case. It was, uh, um, uh, we refer to it as uh, Easton v. Strasburger. Uh, and, and it was held, the, the actual appellate part was, uh, was published in 1984. So, so for some of you, you don't remember 1984, but I remember it really well. And uh, it was kind of crazy how this all came about. But, but without going into too much detail, and I don't know if I've highlighted this one much at all, but uh, you can see that the plaintiff, of course, was the, the buyer, almost always the buyer that sues, right? Um, and then the defendant, of course, was uh, the, the, the brokerages and, and the seller and all that. And so here, as you can see, it's the Court of Appeal of California, the first appellate district. Not that that really matters to any of us here, other than it's got some weight associated with it. And for the lawyers in the crowd today, you always love to see all these uh, case sites citations and, and stuff like that. But, but again, February of 1984, here's the judges, Miller and Smith. Um, uh, and, then, and then we have uh, the opinion. Uh, so the general opinion is that the real estate company uh, appealed from a judgment for negligence entered in favor of the buyer. Um, and then the um, appellant was one of six defendants. So the real estate company was one of six of the defendants in the action. The buyer sued six people, which was brought by the respondent for fraud, including negligent misrepresentation. And so the difference between uh, intentional misrepresentation and negligent misrepresentation is that intentional misrepresentation, you knew that it was wrong and you, and you said what you said to take advantage of the other person. Negligent misrepresentation, you didn't necessarily know any of the truth of whether it was wrong or not, but you went ahead and said it anyway. Um, so negligent, you know, or you didn't do something that you should have done, things like that. And so, and then again, generally negligence in the sale of residential property. So um, again, I'm not going to go through all the facts of the case, but it involved essentially a piece of property that uh, I think you see some of it right here, a, a home with a pool, et cetera, et cetera. Look at this, the big, the, the whole, the price of 170 grand. I assure you the lawyers cost more than that. Um, and so they purchased the property. Uh, and uh, again, the, the brokerage was the listing broker in the transaction. So uh, right after they bought it, there was a massive earth movement um, and subsequent slides destroyed a portion of the driveway. Uh, and so uh, again, then, then the experts come in, you know, myself included, although I was not in that case. Uh, slides occurred because a portion of the property was fill that had not been compacted properly. Okay. And we see this all the time. Oh, by the way, it's in the TDS, right? Okay. So uh, anyway, the, the, the foundation of the house settled. Um, anyway, there was so much damage to the property, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, the value was dropped down about 20 grand. So anyway, long story short. Um, and so that's what happened. And so, so what happened? The case really boiled around whether or not the, the uh, defendants uh, knew about it in the first place, which I think they knew that they did know about it. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, that's not true. The respondent purchased the property without being aware of the soils problems. Um, uh, and, and so the issue, as far as the real estate agents were concerned, now I am getting into a law class, but as far as the real estate agent was concerned was whether or not they did that reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the property. Okay. So again, I will send you these cases, all this stuff that I'm talking about here today, I am more than happy to send to you. Um, again, I want you to know what they say. Uh, we're not going to go through this entire thing. It looks like I did not, um, uh, uh, highlight any of the key items, but it's just too much. But I wanted to show you, usually down at the bottom is the decision um, uh, by the court uh, and then all the explanations 
uh, about it after that. So they have all these reasons. Um, so so here's my here's the soliloquy at the very bottom. Um, <clears throat> Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the reason for the dismissal, by the way, the reversal of the opinion uh, is included in here. Um, and then and then the, the, the holding against the uh, um, the agent. So, OK, so so that's where that all came about. Let's let's go ahead. That's a big case. That was a huge case. Um, and that was the precursor to the agency agency disclosure, Civil Code 2079, um, to uh, our obligation as real estate agents to conduct a reasonably competent, diligent uh, visual inspection of the accessible areas of the property to disclose material facts affecting the value and desirability of the property. All that language all came out of the Easton case. And so, um, but you know, any you talk to any good real estate attorney that that uh, you know is, is is a good real estate attorney, and they're going to know these cases. Okay, all right. So, and they're going to and we talk that way to each other. That's the language that we use. So that's the Easton case. And so, so did the agents have an obligation to make a disclosure back at that time? There's nothing, you know, no harm, no nothing. You know. The agents weren't liable for anything. They didn't have to read anything. They just, you know, all they were doing was essentially order takers, um, much like it is on the East Coast today. Uh, so I'm, I'm a broker in uh, in uh, Virginia, and in, in the state of Virginia, it's pretty much you really don't have to say anything about anything unless you know something for a fact. Um, and then in your judgment, whether or not it would be material. So I'm aware of a house where, you know, a uh, um, a uh, husband uh, killed his entire family in the house and the agents didn't have an obligation to make the disclosure. I'm really, I have a problem with that because I come from California where those disclosures are uh, preeminent that we're going to have to do that. I did a transaction recently with a, an, an agent from uh, Virginia, strangely enough, uh, uh, selling a house in California. She had uh, got her salesperson's license in California, and she was shocked at all of the disclosures that were required in the real estate transaction. And will I show you my list? But um, these were all required. Um, and she said, you know, knowing, of course, that I was also a broker in Virginia, she says, we don't have to do any of that in Virginia. And I said, yeah, I know. But in California, it's a whole nother world, right? It's a land of plenty. So, so, um, so be aware of that. Different states do things differently. California very clearly wants to make sure that we tell everybody everything that we know. So the standard of care for the seller is that they knew or should have known. All right. Is everybody OK with that? Um, OK, so uh, going uh, uh, down a slide here, let's talk about the field case. So so we talked about Easton. Let's talk about field. Field is another great case. Now, field came right out of our backyard, right? So field came out of uh, of uh, Otay Mesa. So this was a case that the pellet, uh, this is again the, the fourth, um, in 1998, um, and it was only partially publicized. Unfortunately, the part that they publicized was the stuff that wasn't so good about us, okay? And so the case itself was really not a case about the real estate agent. The case was really about a statute of limitations on, on the agent's duties with the, uh, you know, how long could, how long did the uh, buyer have to bring a lawsuit against the agents in the transaction? So um, again, fascinating case. Um, I'll give you the summary of it really quick. And again, here we go. So, uh, and, and here they actually, they actually, uh, the two-year statute of limitations uh, established by Civil Code 2079, which I mentioned to you a second ago, um, uh, they, they said it didn't, it didn't apply to this case, um, which was, was kind of strange for us, okay? So, uh, in fact, I think the real estate agent is still practicing real estate, um, but, but um, interestingly enough, um, in this case, and again, I'll, I'll go into less detail, although this one's more fun, um, buyer purchases a property uh, in Otay Mesa, the um, uh, pro single family detached home, the uh, city of Otay Mesa has a water tower on an adjoining property, um, and uh, this, the, uh, the, um, there was an easement on the property that the fields purchased that said that the, uh, that the, um, the tank could be dumped at any time, and it would flood the it could flood the property, including the residents. Um, and so, the the issue again in this one again was was a time barred statute of limitations. But unfortunately, the judge did what they they do they they write dicta. Dicta is the language of the judge supporting their opinion and how they got to the decision they got to. And it was not kind to the real estate agent. Um, their job is not to be kind. Their job is to be thorough. And so unfortunately, in this case, the buyer did not get the preliminary title report. Heads up, in red light, flashing lights, the buyer did not get the preliminary title report until after the transaction had closed. And so at that point, the buyer got the preliminary title report and found out that, in fact, uh, their property could be flooded 
indiscriminately at any time. So I don't know, I ask you a question, would you want to buy a property like that, uh, knowing that, uh, that 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 could happen? And so uh, um, and we have all kinds of stuff in here. Lots of lots of quotes to 2079, which, as you know, uh, your uh, agency disclosure, your uh, 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 CAR form AD uh, comes from that. Uh, we just rewrote it recently um, because uh, uh, of some changes that we wanted to have made, um, writing it essentially in plain English. Um, you know, instead of the listing agent, it became the seller's agent. Instead of the selling agent, it became the buyer's agent. And a lot of that was to clear up a lot of the confusion that uh, that was created by the language in the previous version of the statute. So the fiduciary duty of a broker uh, uh, is independent of the separate obligation impl- Im- imposed on a seller's broker to conduct a reasonable visual inspection of the market and property. So now in this case, we're actually held to have read the preliminary title report and explained it to the buyer. And so the challenge with that is, is that it's contrary to you know, our duty to investigate the property. Um, and again, so the court goes on and on and on. And, I, and, and again, I will send this to you. Um, but but uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the language that was written in the dicta, a lot of uh, real estate attorneys are just confused by the outcome of the case. Um, uh, again, understanding that while it was a statute of limitations case, uh, it was uh, you know, not barred by 2079. Uh, it was still, uh, the, the language was not very kind to the real estate agent. And so unfortunately, us as a community, now we're being held to explain the prelim to people. And again, I mentioned the prelim earlier about the phone call that I got out of the middle of nowhere, uh, only to find out it was a buyer of a property. Um, and so that preliminary title report is very, very important. And so my webinar, my two-hour webinar, that's another one. If I could figure out how to get a, a, a copy of a, of, I can probably do it myself, get a copy of a title report that doesn't have all of the, you know, the, the uh, names of the title companies in it, then I would go ahead and do that. But for purposes of my webinars and for my classes at the university, um, I, I, I uh, use a version that comes from uh, Fidelity, uh, because frankly, they're the ones who stepped up and gave me a copy of that. So again, your, your obligation of disclosure in the in the uh, Easton case, right? Big, that's the big granddaddy of all of them. But then you get into the field case, and the field case says not only do you have an obligation to disclose, but you might have an obligation to also uh, read and interpret. Uh, and and that's the part that really worries me. So um, uh, you know, I am constantly having conversations with buyers that they need to be speaking with the title officer. Um, they can, you know, the phone number is right there on page one. Um, a lot of uh, most Most of the buyers that I work with don't realize that page one contains contact information for the title officer. And so uh, I know for sure I'm going to explain that part to them. um, And then if they have questions, they can go ahead and they can do that. And I'm selling a piece of dirt up in Malibu right now that uh, um, the buyer is, uh, you know, I love this buyer, right? Engineer, retired, um, you know, just loves to dig. You know, he's gone and visited the park service himself and, and done all these things. He's done a lot of stuff. Um, but but again, how many times do you have that buyer who who does that rather than the buyer says, well, I really didn't know what I was doing and I really trusted my real estate agent to help me with that. OK, and so our job is to help them, but it is but it is not uh uh, you know, it doesn't satisfy anything that we do. And it comes up in your disclosure forms. And I'll show you on the Avid on the bottom of page one. It comes up in the Avid uh, that, that the agent's obligation to, to uh, do a, a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the premises does not satisfy the buyer's requirement to investigate the property. And so um, I've had more than one court case where that, that language was plastered up on the PowerPoint in front of the jury. Uh, and so, uh, um, Anyway, so so that's it. Any questions about Field or uh, Easton? Anybody have any comments on that? No, seeing none. Okay, um, it, it, they're important cases. Again, all the material that I work on, I'm more than happy to always send it to you, uh, and and uh, you know because I want you to have it. Um, so um, they were landmark appellate court cases, and they changed the way that California does 
the real estate business. Okay, so again, the the uh, uh, Easton case back in uh, eighty eight, and then the um, and then in ninety eight the uh, uh, field case. Um, we're going to distinguish between disclosures required of the seller, um, but also disclosures required of the real estate agent. So hypothetically, again, after laying all that foundation, hypothetically, the real estate agent doesn't have an obligation to investigate. We, we tell you constantly, don't go down and pull permits, right? There are companies that the buyer can hire that will, will pull permits for whatever fee. Um, and and, and that, that is the buyer's obligation because the buyer's obligation is to investigate the, the uh, agent's obligation is merely to inspect two completely different observations. And some of you will have realized already, we used to have the buyer's uh, inspection advisory, the BIA, and then they kind of softly put in, changed the name of the buyer's inspection advisory and made it the buyer's investigation advisory because that's more appropriately what it was, okay? The buyer has an obligation to investigate the property, okay? So let's talk about the two main types of disclosures. So just briefly, we're gonna talk about the statutory disclosure um, and, and then uh, we're gonna contrast that with the contractual disclosure. What's the difference? between the two of them. A statutory disclosure is one that's required by law. So it'll, it'll say right in the code, right? So for example, I pulled up for you um, uh, some of the uh, information on the various disclosures. Uh, here is the sales disclosure chart from uh, the California Association of Realtors website. Uh, Actually, a pretty good chart. Uh, I, I, I frequently, if I if I have a disclosure issue and my seller doesn't want to disclose something uh, or the buyer wants further explanation, I'll frequently forward this to those uh, parties so that they can read them because they're written in plain English. Like the very first one here, and I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but the very first thing is the TDS and the SPQ. And I have to agree with the attorneys at CAR. I think that they're they're almost one document. The the, the transfer disclosure statement was created by the legislative body. Um, people that don't do real estate. Um, their job there is a lot of times it's political, but it's intended to protect the public, supposedly. Brian Jones, who comes out of Santee here uh, in San Diego, he's probably the only one I know that actually has a real estate license. Um, and I don't even know that he uh, that he contributed to this. But, but in fact, I don't think he did because the TDS came out way before he was elected uh, into office. And so, um, but the TDS you know, it, it's got holes everywhere. Um, the SPQ was created by uh, CAR to try to fix the some of the holes that were in the TDS. And so that's why I made the comment. I think it should be probably the same document. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at these uh, live here in a second. Um, but but then the, the point was the disclosure. Here they are. They're mirroring the two together. Um, your purchase contract, um, we, we argued about it for a long time about whether or not the SPQ should be uh, have its own separate checkbox. You know, but but we we ultimately elected to have the SPQ part of the contract, not something that could be opted in or opted out. And so um, as part of the contract. Uh, you want to be careful about, you know, sometimes you'll have that seller that says, I don't want to provide it. Um, and you want to be careful about helping them by writing language that you think is binding on the parties um, that uh, that takes it out of the uh, contract and the agreement. I wouldn't be doing that. That is definitely legal advice. OK, so. Um, I say this all the time, you know, my, my, my son-in-law is, uh, you know, is, is got asking me to review a document. And so I said, okay, but you understand I'm not giving you legal advice. He says, you tell me that every time I go, I know, I just, it's just something that it's a, like a, a knee jerk reaction. Uh, and he knows, and he's in the legal industry, but he has me look at real estate related forms and stuff. So, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, I'm, you know, I'm proud, you know, he's a great kid, uh, kid, you know, he's 50 something, but, but um, anyway, so uh, on the right hand side, under additional information, it explains, although the TDS is required in, uh, in residential one to fours, there are a number of exceptions or, or exemptions. And, and we should probably take a look at those because it's really, I, I get, I just had a transaction recently where the uh, agent claimed that the seller was TDS exempt. And I, and I have a, a great big long writing back and forth between me and them saying, you know, can you tell us why you think that they're exempt? Um, and, and then finally, we made the disclosure to the, the buyer that, 
we can't give you an opinion as to whether or not the seller is TDS exempt. And so, uh, so let's, I'm going to click on this one here and I haven't done this before, but, but, uh, and you can't see that anyway. So I'm glad I checked. Uh, so um, this is the transfer disclosure statement law, the exemptions. Uh, and this is what we sent to our buyer. This came from the California Association of Realtors. And so, you know, where is it required and what are the exemptions? And so there are four specific exemptions uh, that are noted in here. Um, but but as you can see, and in looking at this and just at first blush, I'm looking at it and uh, the transaction we just did is not one of those exemptions. So just because, for example, in, in, in uh, some cases, um, the, the property is owned in trust, well, frankly, more than half of our transactions are probably owned in trust. Um, and some people are under the misimpression that trusts are TDS exempt. Trusts are not TDS exempt. Some trusts are TDS exempt. Normally, a, 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 um, a um, uh, non-reverting, uh, what is it? A, uh, now I'm gonna, no, I shouldn't have said that. So um, lost my language. Okay, so some trusts are not exempt. And so uh, probably right in the document right here, uh, bu -bu 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 um, obviously, the court is always exempt. Foreclosures are going to be exempt unless the bank exercises dominion and control over the property. Um, but again, uh, this uh, uh, in the administration of a decedent's estate, you know, you got to be able to prove you didn't know about the property, you'd never lived in it, you know, those kinds of things. So, so anyway, I wanted to make you aware of that uh, to pull that up for you really fast. Um, and then, uh, and then back to my document. Um, I think that does a really good job of it, but they also have some quick guides for this. And of course that takes you uh, to a different place. Uh, you can't see that. So uh, here is the other document, right? So again, I'll send all these to you um, if you want them. This is the same as the other document was, right? Quick guide. Yep, it is. Okay. So um, again, so it's, it's funny that the, that the two links in the, in this go to the same place. So, all right. So anyway, enough of that. I just wanted to show you that they also have the sales disclosure chart. Um, and again, this, this falls under that category of, you know, we, we do so many great things, but then once we fix it, we move on to something else, go fix another great thing um, and then forget to tell everybody about it. So um, really just go into the CAR website and type in disclosure. And these are some of the things that pop up. This was just revised in January of this year. Okay. And so um, it goes through all of this and you'll notice from the tab on the right hand side, this document's a monster. Okay. And so you get down into uh, this part where you have your advisability of title insurance. You have it broken down actually very well. Your agency disclosure. Yes, 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 yes. All the way across the board. Um, and again, uh, CAR uh, attorneys uh, had, had the law passed that made agency disclosure prior to to that law being changed only applied to residential one to fours. Now it applies to pretty much everything. Um, and so, and then confirmation of agency. So confirmation of agency occurs in your purchase agreement. Um, and uh, do they have it in the right place? Uh, yeah, okay. So the, uh, the, you, with, the, with the agency disclosure form, you disclose the concept of agency. Um, and then later on, you must confirm agency. And so confirmation of agency occurs in paragraph number two of the RPA as an example. There are other documents as well. Um, and if they don't do it right, in the RPA, and I frequently get them where they've not done it right, um, you, you must fix that with the, uh, the uh, AC6, they call it, which is the uh, confirmation of real estate agency relationship. And I'll show you all this in just a second. But anyway, so this is the whole list of all of the disclosures that are uh, mandatory. Um, and and uh, again, I'm not going to go through each of those uh, independently. So, um, uh, but let's move on with our uh, presentation. If I get my program to work, where is it? Here we go. So again, a statutory disclosure and, and I lost track of what I was doing. You'll notice over here on the right-hand side, we've got the statutes. So the carbon monoxide detector is silicone code 1102.6. And you know that if you're using the current TDS, you don't need to have a separate disclosure, right? Because the TDS has it on page two. Um, uh, as it does the water heater bracing and the smoke detector. And that's why we don't require those separate forms any longer because the TDS was amended to contain that language. The carbon monoxide detector mode, uh, notice uh, compliance falls under uh, health and safety code, right? Things like that. So the BNP code for, for uh, the commercial transactions, uh, business and professions code, um, and then common interest is uh, 4528 is what you and I deal with in our purchase agreement, okay? So, so 
that was the part I, I, I neglected to show you, but that was the whole point behind the statutory disclosure. So there's a law that requires that disclosure to be made. Okay, so they're easy enough to look up. I just showed you the list of the real estate related statutory disclosures. Um, they contain rescission rights. That's important to remember. Um, and a rescission right, uh, uh, we'll talk about a rescission right in a minute, but failure to make the status statutory disclosure gives an offended party the right to reset the contract. So in other words, put the parties back in the position they were in prior to contract. And that comes out of the, of the court holding on that. Okay. So, so statutory disclosures, you definitely don't want to mess those up. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we don't talk about enough is that when you are taking your listing, uh, you want to make sure that you sit down with the seller or you go over with the seller, all the disclosures that are required in the real estate transaction. You've been in real estate long enough. You've got to know what they are. So you sit down with, or your broker has a checklist, sit down with the seller, go through all the disclosures, have them complete them, not you. Uh, and and uh, and at the time of the offer, when the buyer brings their offer in and you send over your counter offer, the the statutory disclosures go over with them. Why? Because they don't have a three day right to rescind the contract if they get the disclosures prior to agreeing to purchase the property. OK, so prior to contract. All right. So that's the whole point behind all of this is that we want to give them the disclosures as early as possible. And and I tell the story of the transaction. I took a listing up in Lakeside uh, or Lakeside uh, Lake Forest up north of us here up the uh, I-5. And the uh, seller happened to be a student of mine at the at the uh, university, uh, probably about 15 years earlier. Um, and they had purchased this property uh, for their mother. They did not use me to purchase the property. Uh, they, they later on they regretted. They they said we regret that decision. But um, they hired me to come in and sell the property. And so I sat down with the seller for three and a half hours. You need and if I sit down for three and a half hours, some people may need more time than that. But I sat down with the seller for three and a half hours, and we went over every single disclosure. They hand filled every single thing out. Now, could I have sat there and let them do it on their computer? Sure. But in this case, they wanted to have they wanted to have eyes on it. Um, and so we had a death in the property within the year. Mom had passed away in the property. Um, we had uh, unpermitted additions. We had all kinds of stuff that were that were you know disclosed. Um, they pulled out the disclosures, which uh, they had still in their possession from when they purchased the property. And how frequently does that happen? Uh, and and so, um, but they completed their own disclosures from their knowledge of the property. Mom had been ill for a long time, so they had spent quite a bit of time at the property. So those disclosures were very, very thorough. Um, and so interestingly enough, the buyer comes along uh, and the buyer says, you know, I want to buy the house. Here's the offer. Um, we countered it. They were way off on price. So we needed to counter it at a higher price. And the uh, and all the disclosures went over to the buyer at the time. And so the buyer's agent who had who, who fancied themselves as representing investors said they'd never seen such a package um, at the time of an offer. And I said, well, we're pretty thorough about what we do. When we take the listing, we're assuming that we're selling the place. Um, so, you know, for us to start gathering up all these disclosures after an offer comes in, uh, defeats a lot of different purposes. One of them, we don't think it's professional. We think you need to have those done at the time of the listing agreement. <clears throat> and so, um, and, and, and the agent was pleased and the agent said, okay, I'm going to give all this to the buyer. And the buyer had everything. They said, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy the place. Oh, by the way, they wanted a 30 day escrow. Now they want a 13 day escrow. So, you know, uh, Jody, I'm buying the RV, I'm getting the tractor, you know, the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it was a good transaction. It's very quick. Buyer did their their own uh, investigation of the property, and they were a flipper. Um, and uh, and they did. They turned around a couple of years later and sold the property for a, a significant profit over what um, uh, they had purchased the property for. But again, the the key issue here was that they got everything before the contract came together. The pretty much no legal no uh, wiggle room. We say um, they had the NHD, they had the HOA docs, they had. You know, the TDS, obviously the SPQ, SPQ, they had everything. So my advice to those of you who are taking listings is 
you're going to have, you know, I'm assuming that your confidence level when you take a listing is that you are going to sell the property. And so why are you scrambling three weeks into this thing, trying to get all the disclosures taken care of? Because I find that a lot of times there's a delay on getting the disclosure signed because the seller is, you know, uh, doesn't understand them. Well, why didn't you explain that at the time of the listing? I think that's going to be important. So anyway, I use that story. Um, I also, in that same vein, um, you know, Joe Cazora, one of our brokers, and I love Joe, um, he did the Abbott. You know, he wandered around the property and did the Abbott. And so, uh, so who signed the Abbott? Joe signed the Abbott. Joe's a broker under Linda. Linda's the broker for the company. Uh, I'm under Linda. I'm a broker associate for the company, as Joe is. And so, uh, and so Joe did the Abbott. Joe wandered around on behalf of Linda because Linda's the big picture here. And some of you are sole proprietor brokers. You want to be really careful, right? Because you know you've got some responsibility. But you know, here's Linda. And everybody's under Linda. And so, um, uh, so uh, uh, Joe did the Abbott. And and uh, and everything was compliant. I would never have had Joe do the Abbott, and then I would have signed it. And that's something the Department of Real Estate is going after teams for right now. Okay, everybody good with that? Everybody understand? Um, so um, it has huge repercussions in a real estate transaction, right? So obviously, you know, uh, you can unwind the deal. Um, or the buyer decides they want to renegotiate the deal. Um, well, you just told them stuff that they didn't know when they bought it, right? So, so do they have the right to renegotiate? Whether they have the right or not, they're going to try. And so that's why I say again, you know, button it up, put it all together, uh, and and get that taken care of, you know, early uh, before the transaction even becomes, uh, you know, something that's happening. So let's talk about some examples of of those statutory disclosures, and then uh, and then uh, you know anything with Cal Civ code in front of it. I think that's the that's the easiest way to say it. So you know, if I go back to my disclosure chart uh, from a second ago, um, where to go here? You know, I'm looking over here, Cal Civ code, right? So there it is. That's my uh, HOA stuff. Um, scrolling down, here it is again, Cal Civ code. I'm looking at a 1710. I know that's death on the property, right? So you know, so the, I have all these down, okay? But anything that's got Cal Civ code in front of it for sure is going to be, you know, has to be disclosed. Here it is again, Cal Civ code 1103, earthquake fault zone. So remember the 1102.3 is the TDS, the 1103.7 is the uh, natural hazard disclosure. Uh, and, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second as well. Uh, so, so be very well aware of that, all right? So uh, that's uh, anything with Cal Civ code in front of it uh, is probably the best way to, to uh, make that metaphor. So uh, for example, 1102. Um, so let's take a look at my TDS really quick. And, and uh, I do wanna take a look at a few of these documents if I can find them again, here we go. Um, oops, they're not gonna expire, don't you expire on me. So uh, uh, haven't been gone that long. So here's our list of templates. Okay. And so, you know, these are the templates that we put together. So we have, for example, the property management template for those, of, you know, because, because I counsel with property management companies, um, we have the lease template. So we, we create one template for both sides of the lease only because, you know, it, it, we do a lot of them, unfortunately, but a lot of times we do end up doing both sides of the transaction. We end up being dual agent because in a lot of cases, other agents, don't do leases. I don't understand that. I think that your job is to help the homeless. And so, um, as I say, you know, I always say help either people become homeless or stop from being homeless. Um, so we have a template for that. We have the buyer offer template. We have the seller listing template. Um, and then we have the, uh, the disclosure. So let's take a look at my disclosures. Um, and so in, even in my disclosures, I broke these down to statutory and contractual. Now I have a, a, a cover sheet in here and I have my seller's listing information checklist, which really doesn't fall under, it's not a statutory disclosure, it's not a contractual disclosure, but but I like the form, it's a good form, SDAR's form, um, the seller listing information checklist asks a lot of really relevant questions. So, so again, looking at my statutory disclosures, uh, let's take a look, I promised you the transfer disclosure statement. Well, here it is. Oh, by the way, why are these in a template? And this is important. So these are in a template because we don't want to copy a transaction that we've been doing that we like so much that without having it in a template format. So CAR, when they updated the library, this is the library over here where it says all forms. This is the library. When CAR updated the library on the 27th of June, they updated all the forms that were in here. They, they made the current version 67 forms, all right? 
folks, I'm saying that I'm putting emphasis on it because 67 forms mean probably a lot of the forms in your transaction were changed. Okay, so if, again, if you have a transaction in progress, don't go changing it, right? If people have been signing the document, if they haven't signed the document yet, then I would bring in the new the new form. But but if they've already signed it, I wouldn't be uh, don't be messing with that. We're not going to touch a transaction in progress. So the same theory, we don't want to change anything that's already been signed. Okay, so so this is our forms library. So all of the forms that were in here were updated if necessary, 67 forms. Um, and then new forms were added. Well, here's the good news, there are only four new forms. Okay, so uh, um, one of them was the, the uh, essentially the mixed use, the residential, Com combined with commercial uh, transaction, you know, where you have like a, a offices or something on the ground level or retail on the ground level, and then the residences above that. So we created the uh, the residential use uh, uh, purchase addendum, um, and so that was a new form, right? So so anyway, this is very important. This is the library, but then we also have the templates. And so when I go back to my list here, I see my templates. So I can look at this list and I know that all the forms that are in here are current. Okay, so they all have they all have the updated forms because they're in the template. CAR will update your template. All right, and so that's why I know all these forms are current. Now they will not add new forms to the template. Okay, so that's something you wanna keep in mind. Well, you only got four, right? So when I go to look at them, so let's go back in here. Where was I? I was in my uh, uh, disclosures template. Here we go, gonna go into my disclosures template. When I go in there, um, the, uh, I lost my train of thought again. Uh, over here where it says all, I'm gonna click the drop down, and there is form update for 623. OK, and so, if, you know, I've been talking about this for months, you know, it, it, prior to this, it said 1222 because we had a major revision in 1222. But when I got over here to 12 to 623, uh, we waited. I was very patient. It was not till the afternoon of of uh, June the 27th that they did it. I'm sitting there on pins and needles because I'm getting ready to teach another class on the new forms. And so look at this. Here's all the forms. These are all the forms that were updated in uh, in. Um, uh, June June 27th of this year. Okay. Um, and again, the ones that are highlighted in here are ones that are in my disclosure packet. Okay. So uh, the, the ones we're going to be talking about here in just a second, that's a lot of forms, right? Um, so, so they will update a form in your template, but they won't add a new form. So if you wanted your residential use form, uh, so I'm going to go down here. Here's my residential units purchase addendum. If you wanted that form to be in there and, and it's part of your disclosure packet, then you would have to add it manually. You click on it, it sends it over there. Now it's added manually. Does that make sense? Um, and so, you know, here's here's uh, what that form, well, I'm just going to show you what it looks like really quick, but there's the residential units purchase addendum. All right. Now, so and I know you're all understanding what I'm saying, but if you have a question, please stop me. OK, but but this is used with a commercial purchase agreement, the CPA form uh, or the vacant land purchase agreement. I'm doing one right now. All right. So these these are things that happen. So I did not have this in my regular uh, purchase agreement uh, uh, template. So I had to add it. So you just got to know the four forms you got to add. OK, that's all. That's all it's going to boil down to. Is everybody good with that? I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to get rid of that form because I don't want it necessarily in my uh, template. And, and I always tell people that delete key, use it judiciously, right? Because once you delete something, it doesn't come back. Um, they don't have the ability to get it back. Now, it didn't go away. It just goes back into the library. OK, that's all that does. All right. Everybody good with that? OK, so now do you want to know what forms changed? Well, I can go over here to my other, uh, where's my other thing here? I can go over here to my uh, my realtor website, to the California Association of Realtors. I can click on Transaction Center. I go over here to Standard Forms. Um, I got to log in again because it logs you out after five minutes of you know snoring or whatever. Um, forms, revisions, and new form, form releases. I go down here, and then I click on my June 2023 Quick Summary, which is, uh, here's all the forms that are in there. So again, here's my four new forms. I have two contingency removal. It used to be the contingency removal for both the buyer and the seller were on the same form. Now we've got the contingency removal for the buyer and we separated it out from the seller. And then we have the uh, RUPA I just showed you. And then we have 
have the RPOQ, which is the rental property owner questionnaire, which is the form now that we're advising that you use in rental transactions. Is everybody okay with that? Um, notice my revised forms. Again, we have 67 revised forms. Um, we have, uh, but only four new forms. So, um, so again, your job is to make sure you're using the current forms. Okay, everybody all right with that? Okay, so uh, where was I? Back over to my disclosures. I take a look at my statutory disclosures. I wanted to show you the TDS really fast. So I pull up my TDS. The TDS, I, I'm not sure if I've ever seen it filled out correctly, but you know, who am I, right? So, you know, it starts off with the, you know, the, the first part of the document. Uh, and, and by the way, the Department of Real Estate changed their regulation just recently. Um, their new regulation is that the TDS is the TDS at the time of the acceptance of the offer. So they don't care that it was done six months ago or a year ago. If this is what you're going to provide to the seller or to the buyer, then you know it is as of right now. So in other words, that's for liability reasons. Now the seller is going to be liable if they're providing a TDS that has changed, for example. So six months ago, the seller created the TDS, and then the buyer comes along, writes an offer on the property, purchases the property, and then the, and then the seller sends over the six-month-old TDS. Well, the law says now that this is the T that, that whatever you've got in there is what it is right now. You can't go back and say that's the way it was six months ago because we're going to call it this moment in time. Is everybody okay with that? It's going to create some real issues for agents that don't understand that concept. So I very frequently don't see this top part filled out correctly, but you can see that that it could be, uh, 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 again, remember, California Civil Code applies to residential uh, one to four. And so it could be a uh, single family home. It could be a duplex. It could be a triplex. It could be a fourplex. But, but a separate TDS is required for all of the units. Um, and again, this was the revision that we just had made back in 623. This is a if you go to the Civil Code 1102.3, this is a picture of that put on CAR letterhead. Everybody good? Okay, the date up here is the date. And as of this date, it is the disclosure. Um, by the way, to answer the question, oops, somebody's probably gonna ask that question. So have a TDS signed after the offer's received? No, um, good question. I'm glad you asked that. Thank you, Dally. So the, so the TDS, I want the seller to complete the TDS at the time of the listing. Okay. So, so let's start with a clean slate. The seller completes the TDS at the time of the listing. Obviously, with my counsel, I'm going to help them through it, walk them through it. Um, I guess you can't say walk anymore, but all right. So I'm going to guide them through it. Okay, I don't complete it for them. And they complete it. And let's say they completed it on Monday, uh, July the 3rd, right? Um, and then the offer comes in on uh, Thursday, July the 6th. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to get from the seller because the seller on July the sixth when we when this offer is accepted the TDS is hot now we're, we're that needed to be signed off by the buyer but I've asked the seller so you completed the TDS on Monday the third has anything changed and again this is in writing has anything changed since that time and then I want to get something back from the seller that says no that is the TDS. Even though it says July the 3rd, it is July the 6th. It is today's date, okay? Um, because that's the way the law is going to hold it, that it is, it is today's date, okay? The date of the contract. So your question's a really good one. Um, and that is that, that uh, and again, you know, go, go to my extreme scenario where it was completed six months ago. I, I don't know that you need to have the seller redo it, um, but I do need to, but I do need to be, have something in writing from the seller that says, no, everything is still the same. Now, remember, if I'm going to, if the seller is going to change anything, then I can either have them do a whole new TDS. If it's six months old, I want them to do a new TDS. Why? Look at this date up here. This was just done. And so I'm probably going to want them to complete the new TDS. Okay, right? Why? Because here it is, the language about the triplex and the du fourplex and all that stuff. So I want them to use the current form. You have the protection from the CAR's user protection agreement as long as you are using the current form. If you are using a dated form six months ago, you don't have that protection. Um, we can get into a side conversation about how much protection that really is, but you know, essentially they write a letter on your behalf at the appellate level. So an amicus brief, it's called, you know, where they just, in front of the court, they just write a letter on your behalf uh, over the preprinted language, right? So, um, so rarely does there ever a lawsuit over the preprinted language. It's usually stuff we fill in, okay? The seller fills in. So again, your question's a good one. If I've got a six-month-old one, I, don't, I want them to use the current form. 
Um, if uh, if they filled it out on uh, uh, June the the twenty uh, seventh and they used the current form, and let's say June the twenty eighth because it was out by then, and they filled it out on June the twenty eighth, and this date over here says June the twenty eighth, right down here, date it says June the twenty eighth, then I'm going to get something in writing from them in writing that says that everything that is on the TDS is still current as of today's date, because this is going to go over with the counter offer to the buyer. The buyer has no three day right to rescind the contract, you know, unless there's an error in the TDS, which is always possible as well. Okay. Uh, and that error being something that the seller did. So for example, I frequently, as the buyer side of transactions, I frequently get the the uh, TDS sent to me. Uh, the the law change is a really good Q and A, and I'm sorry I don't have it here, but the CAR has a really good Q and A about why we added no substituted disclosures for this. Uh, transfer. Um, and the reason that we added it was because uh, the first two check boxes in a lot of situations didn't apply um, because there weren't any additional inspections. There weren't any inspection reports. Um, so we added to the, to the statutory document, no substituted disclosures for this transfer. And so now the TDS considered incomplete, AKA defective, if one of these boxes is not checked. So in most situations, and again, if you send me an email, I will send you the Q&A. It's a really good one um, that we call them quick guides now. But um, uh, so it, one of these boxes needs to be checked. Otherwise, it's a defective TDS. And you remember from uh, the state real estate exam that the buyer has two years uh, to sue on a defective TDS. OK, so it's kind of a big deal. Um, what else? And again, I'm not going to go through the forms like we're going to go through on Tuesday. But uh, I frequently the seller doesn't check the box whether or not they're occupying the property. But more more importantly is down here are are there to the best of the seller's knowledge not yours the seller's knowledge any of the above they're not an operating condition yes or no i frequently get these and one of these boxes is not checked so the next question of course is what do you do if you're the buyer's agent and you receive a transfer disclosure statement that is incomplete well the answer is you send an email back to the agent and saying you know i've noticed a couple of discrepancies in the tds right don't be nasty about it but just say you know i've noticed some discrepancies in the tds do you want to give your seller an opportunity to complete their TDS. I'm more than happy to send what you've sent me over to the buyer and I'm probably going to do it anyway, right? But the uh, if you wanna send a more complete TDS, please give that to us. It's better to get the, co the corrections to the TDS done prior to closing than post-closing, okay? All right. Uh, and then, so that's the first big one, uh, you know, well, other than substituted disclosures up top is this question. Uh, the next big one is going to be down here. Are you the seller? And again, they use the word aware of any significant defects or malfunctions, any of the following, yes or no, frequently get these TDSs and, and neither of these boxes are checked. It's going to be a defective TDS, okay? And so I'm going to send that back and I'm going to say, hey, do you want your seller to complete the TDS so that I can get that over? You know, I'll send the, the one you sent me to the buyer, but but, I, but I'd like to have the a corrected one. You know, as I always say in my business, I'm not going to jail with you. So, uh, you know, I kind of like my freedom. I love my real estate license. You can't have this much fun in any other career, um, but I want to keep that license. That's just kind of an important thing, okay? Uh, and, and so sometimes parts of my days are reading uh, Department of Real Estate's uh, positions statements on, on uh, hearings that they've had. And it's like, oh, I don't ever want to do that. Okay. All right. And so I mentioned earlier about the carbon monoxide device, uh, you know, things like that. And so those are all included in here. Um, frequently, I'll get paragraph number C. If a seller checks no to everything, that's that's on the that's on the seller's agent. That means they didn't sit with the seller and, and have a conversation with them about it. Um, uh, notice down here, paragraph number six, Phil, um, again, the one of the issues in the Easton case, the TDS did not exist then, right? So uh, the court just kind of held that, felt that we really need to be providing these disclosures. So, um, okay. Um, and then seller signs it, obviously, and then the agents do their thing. Um, and by the way, the, the new contract and the legislative intent says that uh, the TDS is not complete until the seller's agent provides their t their avid to the buyer. Okay, so uh, if the agent's going to do an avid, I would recommend it very strongly. It does fall under your civil code 2079 obligation, um, but uh, it, it but the TDS is not going to be considered complete until that's provided. Is everybody okay with that? Um, and then, as I have said uh, repeatedly now, 1102.3, one of my favorite statutes, uh, provides the buyer a right to rescind the purchase agreement for at least three days after the delivery of this disclosure, if 
big word, if delivery occurs after the signing of the offer to purchase, after the contract comes together. If they get it after the contract comes together, they got three days. If they get it before the contract comes together, they have zero days. Everybody good? Okay, all right. Uh, excellent. Okay, so that I, I did want to talk about our TDS. That's a big thing. Um, if you look in here, these are the disclosures. I'm going to show you my template in a second so you can see what our file looks like when we're dealing with a seller. Um, but uh, and, and it, it says that we're modifying a lease template only because that way it didn't apply it to new transactions. <laughs> so that's the only reason it says that. I should probably get rid of that. It just confuses people. Um, so these are my statutory disclosures. These are the disclosures required by law. Here's my agency disclosure. We've talked a, a lot about that today. Um, I'm not going to go deep into this, but this is my, once again, my civil code 2079, one of my favorite places to be. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's a, a disclosure required by law. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, 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 prior to committing, prior to the, anybody doing anything, essentially, Jody, did you say you sent the disclosures with counteroffer? Absolutely, Jody. So, so when I take the listing, I have the seller complete all of the disclosures. Um, I'm, I'm not scrambling later. I get it all done at the time of the listing appointment, um, and then, and then when the offer comes in, I send all of the disclosures over to the seller, or to the buyer's agent, along with the counter offer. So prior to the buyer committing to their contract, they have all of the disclosures. And it's a really important point. So um, again, if I send it after the buyer has accepted and agreed to the transaction, the buyer's got three days to rescind the contract or try to renegotiate or try to do other stuff. So, uh, um, so yeah, I send the statutory and the contractual disclosures. And again, you've got to have your list together of what your statutory and your contractual are. And, and I'm going to show you more of that here in just a second, but, but you've got to have your list available. You've got to, you've got to know, um, I, I would send both. That's what I do. I figure, Hey, when else am I going to have the seller complete the disclosures, whether statutory or contractual, I'm going to have them do all those disclosures at the time of the listing appointment. Um, and so it's just the easiest way to do it. So hopefully I, I answered your question. So uh, that's my agency disclosure. Oops, back to you here for a second. Uh, what else did I want to show you? Anything else in here? I think we're going to probably come back. Lead-based paint. So interestingly enough, my lead-based paint disclosure is not a statutory disclosure necessarily. It's a regulation. So it comes from the Environmental Protection Agency, otherwise known as the EPA. And so lead-based paint is probably one of more powerful than anything else you've seen, okay? It has to also, in California has the only exception to the requirement by the EPA that the lead-based paint disclosure be made um, uh, at the time of contract. Um, and just because of the way we do contracts in California, um, you know, we have contingency periods and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, uh, so the, in California, we're, we just have to make sure we provide it before the, tra the transaction records or closes title transfers from the seller to the buyer. Um, this is a zinger, okay? So if you mess this one up, there are statutory uh, penalties for this. Um, and so, uh, so again, it's an EPA regulation. And why do they make it a regulation? Because they can move around, they can change it at will, they can do all kinds of stuff versus our TDS, where we've got to have the legislative body change it. The EPA just changes this at, as, as they wish. So, um, so, but it's very powerful. And then and it, it applies not only to sales, but also to leases, short and long term, by the way, uh, and rentals. So if you're doing vacation rentals, yeah, it applies. Okay. So anything built pre-78. So for example, Del Mar, you know, pretty much Del Mar was done by 1978, right? So pretty much everything in Del Mar. So you have to give this, and then you got to make sure you're using the current form again. And look at here, 1221 is the current revision of this form. Um, and one of the things, here's what came out in, in that revision is the uh, lead-based paint renovation rule. Um, and so be very well aware of that. I would not be doing things to skirt that issue, okay? So um, the penalty is pretty severe. Um, normally, a citation on this offense is going to be for um, uh, more than one, uh, you know, they're going to start going back through your files and, and, and you're not been doing it, you're going to have a problem. So pre-78, so essentially, you know, pre, you know, January 1 of 1978, okay? Everybody okay with that? 
Uh, let me see anything else here I want to highlight because uh, some of these we won't have to come back to them. Megan's Law Database. Um, so we have a separate form for it, but it's also included by default in your uh, purchase agreement. Um, it's also in your lease agreement, by the way. Um, so the, you don't make the disclosure to the seller during the listing agreement, but the but during the purchase offer or during the lease offer, um, the disclosure is in there and that satisfies the statutory requirement to do that. And your obligation by law is not to go to the database. Your obligation by law is to disclose the existence of the database, and that's about it. And if you've heard me talk before, you know I always say don't go to the database. Part of the reason is that you're going to be held to have constructive knowledge of everybody who is in the database, okay? So uh, kind of a big deal. Um, but again, form is nice. I have, as to this day, I have TC sending me this form, and it's like, you don't need it, you know, and again, it's great, the argument, um, you know, but it's, uh, this one was revised in 623, but remember, so is your purchase agreement. So uh, I'm going to be using the uh, current version of the purchase agreement, uh, so I don't need to worry about this stuff. Uh, any other questions about any of that? Grab the water real quick. Okay, so remember again, my confidence level is high because I am uh, I have created a template, and I know that CAR will update my template. They just won't add the new forms. And again, the good news at this point in time is that there's only four new forms, um, and and so I should be um, adding the uh, contingency removal for the buyer on the uh, buyer side of things. In fact, I'll show you how to do that in just a second. So, uh, question: Okay, to have lead based paint completed even if the home was built after 78? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, does it ever hurt you to disclose something? Um, I don't think so. Um, I would, uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I'm probably, we're not going to probably do that in our files, but, but you know, I always get the question, well, I was built in January the 2nd, so they could have been using lead-based paint. I don't want to hear it. If you're concerned, make the disclosure. There's no harm in disclosing. Just remember that that the uh, that the form itself uh, contemplates properties that were uh, that were built pre seventy uh, eight. So uh, it, so fine. So now you're making a disclosure that properties that are built prior to nineteen seventy eight have this disclosure requirement. This property doesn't have that disclosure requirement, but we're going to disclose it anyway. Okay, all right, that works. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, so great, great question. I, I never, I, you know, and Pete Selecki said this, our general counsel for uh, SDAR made this in a comment. I had him speaking in my law, my legal aspects, real estate classes. And, and he said the same thing. They, they can't, they can't sue you for what you tell them. So, you know, if something comes up that, you know, the tax record was incorrect about the, the uh, date of uh, construction, you know, you're covered. So Dally, great question. That's a really great question. Okay. All right. So that's my lead-based paint. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, back to my uh, dealy Bob here. Um, again, we're not going to go through all these forms. Um, uh, in fact, let's go back to the PowerPoint so I can get me back on track again. So that was my TDS. All right. I love the TDS. Listen, if I'm going to be in court, it's because of something in the TDS. OK, um, natural hazard disclosure. Uh, that's a whole nother issue. Some of you know that we no longer have a form, so we don't even have the form in the uh, in the library anymore. We took it out. So you can go over here and you can you can type in NHD uh, and it, there's nothing. OK, we took it out um, and, and the uh, rationale behind it, interestingly enough, um, actually, that was under my uh, updated one. So let's try it again. Uh, and HD and there's nothing there anyway. OK, so so um, um, the rationale behind it, and I remember talking to Gov Hutchinson, I, I had the, the pleasure of having him sitting right next to me, a, kind of a captive audience when I was chair of risk management and and I said, so, so what? And he says, well, he says, essentially, nobody was using it. And, and why? Because we've trained them to use, to, to have the seller and the buyer use third party uh, uh, persons to come up with that information. You know, the mistake that you make in a, in a real estate transaction, um, in, if, if a seller were to complete the NHD on their own, and folks, we all have those sellers, right? We all have those sellers who know everything and they just want to do it themselves. Um, they could hypothetically get the form by going to the 1103.7, right? They could get the form, but boy, you and I want to have a page of, of and, and definitely talk to your broker. And if you are the broker, you need to be talking to yourself, but you definitely need to have a whole lot of stuff that everybody signs off on that says your recommendation was, your confirming letter was 
that you know uh, that uh, you should probably have a third party uh, who will ensure that uh, ensure the uh, the results of their of their findings. But uh, if you have insisted as an agent on a particular natural hazard disclosure company, and that disclosure company makes a mistake, you could end up getting sued for uh, a negligent uh, referral. Um, so, you know, we we never tell the buyer who to use. We never tell the seller who to use. We make suggestions. We've got a list, but, uh, you know, we and we have our favorites. They're usually at the top of the list, right? But we never we never tell them who to use. And they want to use somebody, or, and as a seller's agent, the buyer asks for a particular natural hazard, let them have it. Okay, somewhere along the line, I'm going to assume that the buyer's agent had that conversation with them and, and that the buyer is the one who chose who the natural hazard disclosure company was. I have a broker up, actually not even a broker, a salesperson up in Malibu. I'm doing a piece of a, a, a land sale with him and he's arguing with me that all natural hazard disclosure companies use the same database. Well, that's partially correct. Um, but some some com some uh, 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 disclosure companies are are uh, disclosing even more than just that. So I want to know if there's a gnat catcher or something else up there. So we use a particular company that does very thorough analysis. I've never heard of a lawsuit against them. Um, I'm, maybe there was. I don't know. I guess I could look that up at some point. Uh, but but uh, you know we're very careful about who we like to use. Okay. All right. Uh, so any. Anyway, so where do I go for my natural hazard disclosure? I, I'd have to take you to my, uh, in fact, I don't have to take you to it. I can go to it myself. Hang on a second here. I can pull up and I, I neglected to do this. I should have done it, but I can, uh, I'm going to pull up a, uh, a fake report. How's that? Uh, and I'm going to show you that fake report. Here it is. So this is, uh, I won't tell you who this is by, um, but this is a fake report. They, they put this together for me because I teach a lot of classes on, on natural hazard disclosure. And the only reason I'm showing you this is because the, uh, the, the state of California requires, it's, so it's a statute, 1103.7 requires that the seller does disclose whether or not the property is located in one or more zones, uh, one or more of six zones identified by the state of California to be hazardous zones. And I, I use the words identified by the state of California, and yet they've never finished the job. So there's a surprise, right? So, uh, so what do I got? I got two earthquake, two fire, two flood. Okay, and so earthquake, I get it. Uh, flood, I get it. Uh, fire, uh, oops, and that's going to trigger what? AB 38. It's going to trigger those requirements to have defensible space and things like that, perhaps, right? So, so I see here, I've got my, here's my flood hazard area. Here's my potential flooding. There's my two flood. Uh, here's my uh, earthquake, or I'm sorry, my, my uh, fire, uh, fire. And then here's my second fire. So two earthquake, two fire, two flood. Here, uh, here is my, uh, and then, uh, and two more. Uh, so my, I'm sorry, my floods were up top and my earthquakes are down at the bottom. So, um, so those are the six uh, zones that the state of California requires. But again, remember that if, if uh, it's in the if it's in the fire zone at all, so in this case uh, it is yes under very high fire hazard severity zone, and then it says right here AB 38 is voluntary on this particular property, and that's what we see in the transaction we we are doing up in Malibu that is voluntary. There's no house, by the way. How do you clear defensible space? It's just land. So. So be aware of that. I wanted you to, to uh, I wanted me to uh, to uh, address that issue of the natural hazard disclosure. So there there is no form anymore in your library. Don't go looking for it. Um, but if you're using it, if you've got a, an old transaction, you keep copying. You are in harm's way. I would not I would not be using that old form. Okay. All right. So anything again with California Civil Code in front of it. Um, anything with BNP code in front of it. And I say BNP because that's the short of Business and Professions Code. Uh, uh, for example, BMP code 10177, and I just kind of pulled this up. Um, one of those conditions in 10177 is failure to disclose your interest in a property. And an interest can be a lot of different things. Notice it's in uh, it's in quotation marks. So that interest in the property could be an ownership interest. Um, I had a transaction uh, quite a few years ago now where I represented the buyer and the uh, the listing agent, you know, you know, Mr. Assertive, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so buyer wasn't happy in the transaction, buyer discovers during the transaction that that the uh, trust that owns the property that the that the uh, agent is representing, well, the agent is the trust. 
So they looked up the trust and, and the trust was the agent. So the agent did not disclose their interest in the property. That is a license losing opportunity. That is BNP code 10177, okay? License losing opportunity. And by the way, that BNP code is also the same one that has the realtor acknowledgement form that, that we use. And that realtor acknowledgement form, you should be using that in every transaction that you do. And that's the form that, that explains the difference between a licensee and a realtor. Um, and I use that, that that's my close in every in almost every transaction that I do is is the fact that now you know they're they're realizing that you know we've got you know maybe 435,000 licensees in the state of California but less than half of those around 200,000 are actually real tours and I read an interesting statistic on the way in to teach this class that we've lost 60,000 um, uh, real estate agents already um, in uh, nationally um, you know as a result of the change in the economy right so people you know they come in when the going's good they get out when the going's not so good I guess in the last year or two people have the impression that, that the going is not so good I'm going to tell you that that just that smacks in the face of wisdom um, you know, the market is always good for you. You're just here to help people facilitate a process. Um, but some people are in it just looking for, the, you know, maybe you're looking for the money. I don't know what, but uh, 60,000. And, and that's only the beginning. I think it's going to be a lot more than that. Uh, NAR is well over 1.2 million members. Uh, I think you're going to see that number get down close to a million. I think it's a lot of people. So, uh, um, yeah, all right. Um, that's okay, though, right? More food for the rest of us, as we say. Um, okay, so that's 10177. Um, why are they required? Why are these disclosures required? Well, East and West Coast have different approaches to the issue. So um, again, in California, everything has to be disclosed. On the East Coast, states prepare the disclosures for the seller. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, it, it, even so much as even uh, disclosing uh, HOAs and stuff like that. I mean, I can't believe they take on all that work. Uh, it could be why the personal property taxes are so high. Um, but uh, the states, a lot of, in a lot of cases, the state prepares the disclosure for the seller. So why are they required? Let's talk about the seller to assure that, that those with the most knowledge of the property share that information with the buyer. Who's going to know the property better than the seller? Now, I get it. You always have that seller that I've never lived in the property. Yeah, I know, but you're not exempt, right? Okay. Just because you didn't live in it doesn't mean, you know, NA across the TDS. I would not be doing that. Um, let's take a look. In fact, let's take a look for a second because I did pull that up for you. Uh, so we'll take a look down here at the exempt seller disclosure uh, to see what the, uh, you know, what, what that rule says. Um, and again, I had a transaction where the agent insisted, the broker insisted that the seller was exempt. So all the seller gets with an exempt seller disclosure, all the seller gets is the, the right not to use the form, not to use the TDS. They still have to make disclosures of those things that they knew or should have known. This is assuming that they are exempt. And remember, again, we're talking about disclosures here. Remember, again, that the, that, that, uh, the decision as to whether or not a seller is exempt is a legal decision. So you want to be asking for, uh, you know, some documentation from an attorney that says that the seller is exempt, okay? I'm going to tell you, in most cases, they're probably not exempt. They just think they are, okay? So look at my revision date. Um, uh, this is going to be the 6, uh, 623. Um, and then here's all this. Now, some of you will say, well, wow, this looks vaguely familiar. This looks a lot like the first part of the SPQ. And the answer is, yes, it is. Because why? Because the TDS did not do the all the disclosures that needed to be done, the statutorily required disclosures. So remember that SPQ? So the SPQ starts off with essentially all these items here that are also required, death on the property in the last three years. Remember, we just talked about that, Civil Code 1710, right? So, you know, these are things that just, you know, in my brain, it's like, well, they died in the property. You have to make the disclosure. Well, it's not on the TDS. So I don't have to do that. I don't think so, um, but okay. All right. So, uh, so anyway, that's my exempt seller disclosure. It's got all this happiness in it. Uh, and then uh, moving back to my PowerPoint here. So that the, those are the most knowledge of the property and, and whether they're a flipper, I don't care what they are, they are not exempt. They must disclose what they knew or should have known. That is the standard for the seller. Okay. All right. Uh, what about the agent? Uh, to assure that the real estate professional, this comes straight from the Department of Real Estate, by the way, does their due diligence in the real estate transaction. That's why the real estate agent is required not only to make the disclosure, but also to deliver the disclosures. Okay, so if I were to go back to my um, natural hazard disclosure, if I can find it again, here it is, back to my ha 
natural hazard disclosure notice that uh, consistent with the legislative intent, I have a signature of the seller, I have the signature of the seller's agent, and then I have the signature of the buyer. There is no signature of the buyer's agent. Why? Because the statute requires that the buyer's agent doesn't have to sign the document. They just, they are responsible for delivering the document. So as long as they deliver it. So as I said a second ago with my uh, disclosures, the agent must make their own disclosures, reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection, but they must also uh, relay the information uh, given by the seller. Okay, so, um, and again, as the agent, if the seller's agent gives you, the buyer's agent, the disclosures, they are considered essentially received at that time by the buyer. So you need to make that move pretty quickly. Okay, so some even have the potential of costing you your real estate license. Um, clearly, if you don't, if you don't relay a statutory disclosure during a transaction, you're probably going to cook for that. Okay, all right. Uh, what's the difference? Again, some of this may be a little redundant. Statutory disclosure. What is it? Rescission rights. Right. Okay. Put the parties back in the position they were in prior to creation of the contract. Um, uh, agency disclosure. We've talked about that a little bit. I don't think I'm going to go back and revisit it, but um, you have an obligation at law to disclose the concept of agency. That's the purpose behind this form. All right. Um, I think I am going to go back just to give you a visual. Uh, frequently, it's a, a better idea that you can actually see, you know, what, what things we're talking about. So here's my agency disclosure. This is a standalone form, by the way, but it, it is the same form that is provided um, attached to all of your offers, all of your listings. And so this is that agency disclosure. So again, this is not create contract. This merely discloses the concept of agency. Uh, you must still confirm agency in the uh, purchase agreement. Paragraph number two happens to uh, extend that purpose. So uh, Civil Code 2079, um, pre-1978 housing. We've talked about that already. It's the LPD form, the lead paint disclosure form. Um, it was a significant change in the form. So, so we changed the name of it. Uh, and again, $16,000 per offense, and it's never one. It's almost always like eight. It's kind of like a fair housing complaint. It's always like eight. Um, and fair housing is much more expensive. So that roughly 64,000 per offense. Um, uh, the TDS we've already talked about. We went through that. Um, I love the TDS. It's got lots of great stuff in there. And folks, I should tell you, you know, I'm not going to step in front of your broker, but if you ever have trouble filling out any of these forms, you know, I'm available. Jody used to call me all the time. I know we probably answered all of your questions, but, uh, you know, I want to help you. I want, I want you to be doing okay. Um, so, you know, whenever there's a question, make sure, you know, you, you consider me a resource. Um, uh, the AVID, again, that is a part of civil code, your, your civil code 2079 obligation uh, to uh, do a reasonably competent, diligent visual inspection of the premises. Um, and uh, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill into this form when, when we get to Tuesday of next week. Uh, so uh, thank you, Joe. You're, you're very kind. I appreciate you. I really do. Um, so, and you owe me lunch for crying out loud. Uh, if y'all don't know, Jody uh, owns uh, Chief's Restaurant in Solana Beach. So uh, great place. You need to go visit it. Shameless plug. I love it there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, even if you do endorse the Broncos, I, I get it. Um, okay. Uh, saying that from an old Redskins fan back here. So uh, final inspection report, again, my home fire hardening, um, you know, the, uh, again, civil code 1102.6, carbon monoxide detector. We talked about that. We have a form. You don't need to use it as long as you use the current uh, TDS form. Uh, same thing with a smoke detector statement of compliance. There's no obligation to use the, the separate form. It's included as long as you're including the current TDS, which we just saw the revision date on that. Very important. Um, uh, there it is included on page two of the current TDS. Uh, so is the water heater bracing statement of compliance. So all those things, again, I still get bombarded with <clears throat> stuff from transaction coordinators who, who are, I, I guess they're just trying to be thorough, but you know, at the end of the day, you really don't need it. So the, it's what we call in the military, we call it the department of redundancy department. So you really don't need to have all that stuff. Um, water conserving fixtures compliance. Yes. Civil Code 1101 and uh, uh, 0 0.4 and 0.5. Um, so we need to have that. And we have that WCMD form, right? Uh, let me see here. Should be my water conserving form. Do, do, do. Uh, did I pull it up? Uh, bah, 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 bah. There it is right there. My WC, whoops, grab the wrong one. You know, only I could miss that. Uh, it's right below it. Here we go. So my uh, water conserving plumbing fixtures and carbon monoxide detector notice. So, so yeah, 
Um, actually, I'm not even sure that you need this form anymore. Um, I, I have to th uh, think about that a little bit. But uh, in San Diego, we no longer have the water conservation certificate. Um, City of San Diego has come back and said, we think we've got everybody. Um, so in San Diego, you don't need to use the water conservation certificate form anymore. Uh, that came up in the risk management meeting before they booted me out of it uh, at SDAR. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so uh, natural hazard, we already talked about that. I don't know why that's showing up again. There is no CAR form. We took it out of the equation. Seismic hazard included in, uh, you know, 1103, right? So 1103 right here. Whoops, went for, jumped ahead. Um, so a lot of these uh, here are all included in the um, in the NHD uh, form that is provided by the, the uh, natural hazard disclosure companies. And so, again, I should have a space between 1103 and at sequitur. At sequitur just means and following. Um, again, there's that big Latin thing for you. Um, and then uh, 1103, again, special flood hazard area, state responsibility area, no CAR forms for this. Uh, very high fire hazard severity zone. Um, airport in the vicinity. These are all included, hopefully, in the natural hazard dis disclosure company that you are using. Double check those folks because not all of them do these things and they're required. So if you're using one of those inexpensive natural hazard disclosures that may not include these things, you still have the obligation to make the disclosure and they're going to come back and say that they didn't do it, they weren't required to do it. Um, so, uh, question, uh, city of San Diego, no water, no water conservation, uh, uh, certificate. Uh, how about other cities in the county? So city of San Diego. So, uh, um, I, and I, and I feel your pain, you know, I live in Del Mar, um, Del Mar, we call it the people's Republic of Del Mar. Uh, and we, you know, I have no idea what, you know, anymore, you know, I don't understand how come my water bill is $385 a month. Um, and uh, they're telling me because I'm in tier one, which means I live at the water. I'm, I'm ocean front, right? But you know, my neighbors up the hill are in tier three, and so they're paying, you know, uh, probably three hundred and seventy dollars a month. So you know, but uh, you go figure. Every area has its own difference. That's why I never make a blanket statement. So that's a great question. Okay, um, no airport in the vicinity. There's no CAR form for that. Again, we just assume you're going to use a natural hazard company that'll make that disclosure for you. Areas of potential flooding. Um, again, remember two earthquake, two fire, two flood. Um, there is a tenant, uh, there is a tenant flood hazard disclosure form. Um, and so, and, and I like the form, and I want to show you that form just really quick. Uh, let me see if I can find it really fast. And and uh um, so there isn't a form corresponding in the sale transaction, but there is one in the tenant transaction. And so again, here's that form. Um, and so when I have a tenant, um, obviously that's when you're going to use the form. I, I probably 90% of the real, 90, 99% of the real estate agents I, I speak with don't realize there is such a form and it is required by statute. So um, information about flood hazards, I am always going to check this box. Okay, why? Because for the same reason, I always check the box on the natural hazard disclosure because they, they can't sue me for something I tell them. So in other words, if I tell them it's in a flood zone and it's not, there's no lawsuit. If I tell them that it's not in a flood zone and it is, there is a lawsuit and that's gonna be a losing opportunity. So my safe bet is always to check the box, correct? Okay, so, <clears throat> and then by the way, city of San Diego um, or county of San Diego, I'm sorry, if you go to the county's website, and you can get there kind of loosely by going through this. Um, but the county of San Diego has a website where you can literally type in the address of the property and it'll pop up whether or not it's in the zone. So if you're doing uh, in the flood hazard zone. So if you're doing a rental, then you, you, you need to be probably having your owner uh, check that up, your RPO, your rental property owner, check that out and, and then provide that to the tenant. But, but I'm always going to suggest that they check the box that says it's in the zone. OK. All right. Uh, question. Nope. I got everybody. Uh, let me see here. OK. All right. Uh, next. Where am I? Oops. Uh, yeah, I'm coordinated. Okay. So, uh, so again, there is a flood hazard zone for uh, a flood 
hazard zone disclosure for the tenant. Um, no earthquake fault zone, once again, uh, Civil Code 1103, so that's going to fall under the uh, natural hazard. Uh, whoops. Uh, uh, common interest development documents, there's no form for that. Does not fall under the natural hazard. Well, actually, it does in, in some respects. They disclose, you know, whether there's Melarus and things like that. And that's a good example of something that some of the companies make the additional disclosure on um, that, that uh, not all of them do. And so remember, the disclosure of whether or not the property is located in a Melarus or Ruse assessment district is a statutory requirement. And statutory, again, means the buyer can kill the deal uh, within three days of receiving the disclosure. And that's just fact number one. But fact number two is they closed the transaction and they weren't told about it. You're going to get the bill. All right. So you want to make sure that they have all these disclosures during the real estate transaction. I think these disclosures are so easy to do, um, but I just think that sometimes we think that uh, that real estate should be easier. We get handed a check for I don't know how much your checks are, but maybe what ten thousand. Let's say ten thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, and and yeah, I know you work hard and you do a lot. And I get it. I'm you know I'm in the same business you are. You know I work hard for less than that. Um, you know I'm doing a, a, a manufactured home where I'm going to make twelve hundred dollars. You know, but but I but I handle it. I'm zealous about it. I want to make sure that it's done right. So, is there a common interest development? Oh yeah, there is. Uh, and so, 4525 uh, civil code is going to apply to me, and and uh, I want to make sure that those documents go to the buyer. Okay, so. So there is no form, but it is in your RPA. You know that, um, and it's uh, uh, is definitely a statutory requirement. Um, notice uh, or actual knowledge of release of an illegal controlled substance, like a methamphetamine or something like that. Um, unfortunately, with if there's an MCN, a methamphetamine contamination notice, that's not something that's easily cured. Um, it's not something you take a broom to it or, or a, a mop to it. It's something that requires professional uh, guidance to get rid of that stuff. It, it explodes much after the, the, the topic itself is gone. I'm, I'm working with a, a broker right now that's uh, forming a brokerage that, that uh, um, you know, we were talking about the fact that they're buying large quantities of properties around the country um, and putting them back on the market. And some of the things that we've talked about are, are for example, I represented a bank who was buying 400 homes a month um, and, you know, in, in New York and Boston and places. And so they, we had people everywhere and they would literally go into the house and, and uh, one house in particular, they walked in, there was no front door. I think the owner took it off for repairs, right? hypothetically trying to get rid of the tenant. Um, and they walked in, there's an open flame in the kitchen, and then there's meth in the house. And so they backed out very slowly because methamphetamine is highly toxic, highly volatile. It will explode. It'll level the place, uh, if not the neighborhood. So it's very dangerous. So, um, so if there is a notice, um, you know, and, and the natural hazard disclosure should find that um, uh, you know, that's one of those things where you may not be able to, to, you may not want to close the transaction. I know that we walked away from a lot of houses that uh, obviously the property wasn't worth the cost to rehabilitate it. So uh, um, anyway, that's my MCN. Um, flood disaster insurance requirements, that's going to be U.S. code. Okay, so not a California code, that's a U.S. code thing. Um, and so uh, you have to disclose that existence. And again, in that chart that I showed you earlier, which again, I'll send to you if you send me an email, um, it contains that gas and hazardous liquid transmission pipeline notice. That's a real touchy subject. Uh, how would you like it uh, if, if the bad guys were aware of the fact that, or guys or gals, sorry, in California, but uh, we're aware of the fact that there's an eight foot wide pipeline going down underneath Rosecrans that is filled with natural gas. Now we argued with the legislative body about the disclosure of those things because of, of the potential for terrorist activity. And yet uh, they, they insisted that you had to make the disclosure and that it was for the public safety and all that kind of stuff. And so it's like, well, then why do you let people live there if it's that big a deal? But at the end of the day, it is the law. You must, Civil Code 2079 says you must disclose the existence. Um, that is going to be in your uh, SBSA has a link to uh, your statewide buyer and seller advisory has a link to the database. So you can pull that up fairly easily. Uh, death on the property. We've already talked about that. You've got an obligation at law to disclose the death on the, pro the seller has an obligation that death on the property within the last three years. Um, and, and again, manner of death, unless they died of uh, AIDS or HIV, and then you don't have to disclose the cause of death. Um, uh, 
So obviously, I don't have to tell you means that what that they died of AIDS or HIV. But again, that's Civil Code 1710. That's kind of a big deal. Um, and then I have my Megan's Law disclosure again, which we talked about earlier. Your requirement falls under uh, Civil Code 2079. Most all of your stuff falls under 2079. Uh, notice of special tax and or assessments. Again, my Mellow Roos assessment. Um, uh, some people would argue that Mellow Roos is an illegal tax, um, but it's not a tax. We changed the name. We call it an assessment. So I guess that means it's not a tax. So therefore, it's not subject to Prop 13, which was intended to limit government taxation uh, in California. And of course, constant beating on that uh, to try to uh, get that repealed so that you know they could uh, raise more taxes. So I, I don't know. I guess they don't have enough money. If the seller has actual knowledge of industrial uh, use and military ordinance, no, this, there's no I between the D and the N ordinance means stuff that goes boom. So what do we have in San Diego? We have Tierra Santa, we have Coronado, we have, you know, we're still finding unexploded ordinance in places. And so, you know, very, very dangerous. Again, Civil Code 1102, um, but it's not in the TDS, right? So uh, so we have that in the uh, SPQ. Um, uh, and it's also Code of Civil Procedure. Uh, these are all things that you had to study in law school, by the way. So, uh, uh, contractual disclosures, just really quick, a couple of those. A contractual disclosure is, uh, and I'm still going to get you out of here. Well, we'll get out of here on time, if not a little bit early. But a contractual disclosure is just something we put into the contract. Okay, statutory um, rescission rights, right? Contractual disclosure, uh, it, it could have cancellation rights, okay? Very, very different. And so let's talk a little bit about that. It's determined by the relationship between the parties. So, so what is it? It's got a cancellation right uh, potentially to it. So for example, um, the buyer has a right, actually by law, the buyer has a right to investigate the property. There is no law that requires a seller to fix anything. In fact, there's no law that requires a seller to bring the property up to code. The buyer can be made to do that, right? Um, so, so point of sale compliance, things like that, the buyer could still be forced to do that. Um, and we're not going to talk about the VA just yet because the VA um, has other rules uh, that are essentially national rules. But in California, the, the seller, uh, the sales of real property are in their present physical as is condition, which means um, the seller must disclose what they knew or should have known, whatever they were aware of, but they don't have an obligation to fix anything, including bringing anything up to code. They don't have an obligation to do any of that kind of stuff. Now, can the buyer refuse to do it? Sure. And then the transaction falls apart. I get it. <laughs> but there is no requirement, excuse me, for the seller to do that. So, so that's a, a potential cancellation right. So now remember, my statutory disclosures have rescission rights, very powerful. And so, and your questions today have been really good. So the buyer goes away right? There's not going to be a big fight because you know, it's, a, it's a statutory right to receive the contract. Um, again, they need to be talking to their attorney if they're going to try, to, if the seller is going to try to keep them or, or the seller's agent is going to try to keep them in the transaction. But for a statutory right, um, you know, it's going to be an interesting fight. Let me know how that goes. Okay. But with a contractual right, something completely different. So again, the buyer has an obligation at law to investigate the property. That means hire an inspector, do the investigation themselves, do whatever, but it requires a very thorough inspection of the property. I've read enough court cases where, um, in fact, I should show you here. I want to show you the, because the Avid, again, one of my favorite documents, but uh, let's take a look at my Avid and I want to go down to the bottom of page one. And, and if I see this, almost every case I have, um, I see this plastered up against the wall, you know, for the, on the PowerPoint for the jury to see what this means to you. Um, and, and so some of the attorneys that I work with that are essentially defense counsel for brokerages are really quite brilliant. Um, and this is what we wrote in this document that nobody ever reads, right? Page one, there's nothing to do except fill in the address, right? So an agent's inspection is not intended to take the place of any other type of inspection, nor is it a substitute for full and complete disclosure by the seller. So the seller makes the disclosure, the agent makes an inspection. It is not intended to replace the buyer's obligations. So regardless of what the agent's inspection reveals or what disclosures are made by the sellers, California law specifies that a buyer has a duty to exercise reasonable care to protect him or herself. This is the damning clause. This is the one that messes the buyer up because the buyer is put on notice of this. And so unfortunately, you and I, maybe we glance over this too quickly when we have the form in front of us, but we need to be going over these forms with the buyer. We need to avoid the temptation of, of sending it. I had a case where the, the agent said, well, yeah, just anytime I got a disclosure, I just gave it to my TC and they sent it to the buyer. 
yeah, I know, but but you have an obligation to go over it with the buyer. And so their defense to that was, well, I told them if they have any questions to give me a call. That is a really poor defense. Okay, well, needless to say, we were involved in a lawsuit and millions of dollars uh, and, and, and a lot of it because of that kind of that flippant attitude that they've got a problem, they can let me know. Well, now they, they have a problem and now they're letting you know. Okay, all right, so... Uh, this duty encompasses facts which are known to or within the diligent attention and observation of the buyer. Now, arguably, in the Easton case, there were there were cracks in the pool that should have given some evidence that there was a problem. But again, the buyer is going to say, I'm not a pool inspector. I don't know those kinds of things. Uh, therefore, in order to determine for themselves whether or not the property meets their needs. OK, so, for example, had one just recently where the, um, the buyer was buying the property, the uh, buyer's intention, big backyard buyer's intention was put a pool in the backyard um, but then when they got the preliminary title report it showed an easement running along the middle of the backyard which would have defeated the ability to put in the pool um, and so you know was so is that a statutory thing well the buyer had made it very clear to everybody that they intended to use the property to put in a pool and even the seller wasn't aware that that there was a, an easement running the length of the backyard of the property but the buyer exited the transaction and then we brought in another buyer who bought it who didn't care about having a pool Okay, so uh, um, uh, so uh, as well as the cost to remedy or uh, any disclosed or discovered defect. And so here we go in bold print. Okay, not even a period, a comma. Buyer should one review any disclosures obtained from the seller. Oh, yeah. And, and the agent should be going over the disclosures with their buyer as well to obtain advice about and inspections of the property from other appropriate professionals. OK, good. Have third parties do that. You don't want to be doing that. Don't assume the risk of that. And then number three, review any findings of those professionals with the persons who prepared them. So the buyer comes up with the uh, physical inspection, had a physical inspector do it. They need to talk to the physical inspector about those about those items that the physical inspector noted. That's why I always say I want the buyer present at the physical inspection. I want them asking questions rather than getting a cold report. Um, and clearly you and I as real estate agents are not that person and we are not, we are not capable of, of explaining those things to the buyer. They need to be speaking to the, uh, you know, remember, now remember the field case? I have a problem with that, right? Because field says that maybe I should be spending some time, um, you know, reviewing and, and uh, confirming that information, which is, just kind of a problem. But, but anyway, if the buyer fails to do so, buyer is acting against the advice of broker, okay? And so, you know, when I go back up in here into CAR and I click on uh, sample form, oops, where'd it go? Here we go. I go up here into the library and you all will be interested in this. I did this talk earlier today, but uh, CAR has their sample form. See sample letters right there, C-A-R-S-L, sample letters. And then in here, I've got uh, the... Um, where to go? Acting against the advice of the broker, acting against the advice, you know, on the buyer side, acting against the advice of the of the uh, broker on the seller side, um, and essentially very similar to our confirming letter that uh, I talked about this morning in in the uh, maintaining records reducing risk class. Okay, so great stuff. Uh, again, it falls under that category of, you know, we give you so much great stuff, but then we forget to tell you that it's there. So again, how did I find that? I went to all forms. I clicked on sample letters. Uh, and then uh, those sample letters were, you know, acting against the advice of the broker on the buyer side, acting against the advice of the broker on the seller side. And you'll notice right in here, you know, making a completely or partially non-contingent offer. Um, and so I'm going to have you sign the MCA. And so we're seeing lawsuits today from those buyers that bought property. They were told to, you know, that they the seller was only going to accept their offer. It was non-contingent. Uh, and then the buyer comes back later on after closing and says, I didn't know all these things about the property. The seller didn't tell me any of that stuff. And my agent told me to write a non-contingent offer in order to get it accepted. And so again, we have lots of disclosure forms in the event uh, to, to uh, protect yourself against such a, a claim, uh, make sure you're using those. We have the CR form. Um, we have the non-contingent offer advisory. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure I have those in. And do I have those in here? No, I didn't put those in here. Um, but we have uh, forms for that purpose. Um, I didn't put them in here. Isn't that odd? I've got my buyer interest letters, you know, otherwise known as the love letters. Just had one yesterday where the buyer says, I want to write a letter. Look at that. And here's the picture. I want to send a picture of me with my dog. And it's like, oh, no. So anyway, uh, fortunately, the buyer was savvy enough. We sent them the, uh, the uh, buyer interest letters uh, information from the uh, 
uh, CAR website, um, as well as the fact that we we asked the seller's agent if they would entertain a buyer letter, and they said no. Um, the, the, their listing agreement says no by default. Everybody good with that? Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're kind of hitting in the home stretch here. Let me go back. So my contractual containing rescission rights again may be an opportunity for the parties to exit the, the contract without a penalty. Okay, maybe um, the RA form. I love the RA form. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I think uh, that's one of those forms that you're going to sign in front of the client. Uh, let's go ahead. I want to add it in here under my folder. I'm going to go up here to all forms. I'm going to go back to CAR forms and I'm going to type in my RA. Uh, and of course, there's a whole bunch of RAs, but it's the realtor acknowledgement form. It says it is in there. Um, so I just, I guess I don't know where it is, but uh, where did I put it? Uh, probably now, here it is. So with my realtor acknowledgement form, um, again, I sent it to this to you earlier. There we go, b and code 10177, near and dear to my heart. Uh, again, you know, you, you, you wanna probably, you know, I don't need to know the DMV code uh, for real estate. I need to know the DMV code for other reasons, but, but I definitely need to know the real estate related codes. So there it is. And then uh, here's the explanation by CAR as to the difference between a licensee and a realtor. And again, I said that earlier that that's my biggest close. I'm gonna use this in every transaction in the very beginning. It's one of those things I have the client sign at the time of the offer. I have them sign it at the time of the listing um, and it kind of closes that door on, uh, I wonder who all those other people were. I thought everybody had a, had a real estate license. Well, yeah, they do, but not everybody's a realtor. Um, and so that's that's the big difference. I like that form, sign it in front of them, give them a copy, do your warnings, and I'm not going to pull all these up, but you have your cyber crimes advisory. It's huge. Every NAR meeting I go to, I'm on the risk management issues committee. Every meeting we have the FBI come in and they always have these great big PowerPoints giving us the newest rendition of how many of these things that we're seeing. Uh, I've got an email myself personally from uh, the Secret Service about the land schemes that are going on. Um, I remember I kicked it upstream to the committee, uh, and then, of course, half a dozen of the people on the committee said, how do you know it came from the Secret Service? And so I know it came, I know who it came from. And so, I go, of course, I went to the Secret Service's website, pulled up all the information and proved it before they would present it actually to the Risk Management Issues Committee. And so, um, again, I'll send you a copy of that if you want. Send me an email. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, but, boy, these things are, are not going to get better um, and, uh, and these were situations where uh, people were calling up the agent saying, I want to list my land for sale. I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't been there in 20 years and, and, uh, they're just finding pieces of land that are sitting. Uh, and so, uh, and I just had one in the neighborhood where, uh, they listed a property. And, and then of course it turns out that the seller had no idea that the property was listed for sale. The, the, the seller who claimed to be the seller was out of another country who, uh, uh, we're just looking to make some quick money. And so it's the, it's the current version of things. So watch out for that. Um, wire fraud advisory, rampant, ongoing, constantly. I've got some really good FBI presentations. If you want copies of those, send me an email. I'll send you that. Um, local area disclosures. Again, the poster child for disclosures in San Diego County. And I go into other places and there it is up on the board. Everybody's talking about the uh, LAD form. I think it's one of the uh, best disclosure forms. Um, and, and they usually cite it as an example of what local associations should be doing for their members. Um, and so um, statewide buyer and seller advisory got lots of great stuff in there. Um, and, and again, it was our, our first introduction to the membership uh, of the grid pattern. So we did the grid in there. We did the table of contents. Um, and the LAD ended up following that example. Um, and then the purchase agreement, of course, later on, paragraph number three is the grid, as we call it. Market conditions advisory. Uh, have the buyer sign that at the time of the offer. So all of these forms and this form should be signed at the time of the offer. I always have all of those forms in my offer package going out, uh, my, my WCMD form, um, my environmental hazards disclosures, uh, uh, um, probably not going to be necessary if I get the natural hazard disclosure that the buyer chose. Um, but, but again, um, you know, I'm going to have all those forms attached to my offer, especially that market conditions advisory. I don't know what the market's doing. You know, I, I, you know, I'm an expert witness on, on market, uh, and yet I don't know what the market's going to do. I mean, you know, I can tell you what it's done, um, but, 
but literally, you know, that's what I get hired for, not, not what it's going to do a year from now. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we see interest rates today that we haven't seen in a decade. Um, and has it slowed the transactions? Yeah, except that a good number of our transactions are for cash. So, um, so yeah, um, okay. So, um, again, our disclosure is very, very important. Statutory versus contractual. Rescission rights go to statute. Contractual rights go to contract. Right. Uh, and uh, so we have some other forms, the SPQ. I just want to show you that briefly um, because the SPQ is actually uh, a form that was copied. Uh, essentially, the idea was copied from the San Diego Association of Realtors Risk Management uh, form, which was the SAD or the Seller's Additional Disclosures form. Um, so that's my seller property questionnaire. I just want to show you the beginning of it because I made a comment a minute ago, um, and it says right up here at the top that you need to be using both. Um, but but then I look at my disclosures and look at that. There's my ESD right there, right? So essentially, exempt seller disclosures are all there um, uh, because we want them to make the disclosure. Um, if if they are required, it's not included in the TDS, so that creates a problem for us. So we want to make sure that those are included. Um, the seller's affidavit of non-foreign status. Status uh, where I get in trouble with this form is uh, this is called my FERPTA. Uh, let me see if I can find. I don't want to spend a whole lot more time on this, but uh, uh, the FERPTA. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 uh, there it is right there. I was going to go back and do it from the other page, but okay. So this is uh, completed for each transfer or, and by the way, updated recently, 1221. So if you've had a transaction that hasn't closed and it and it, you just started the transaction in 12 of 22, then you probably want to include the 1221 form, okay? So uh, here's where we get in trouble on this. The seller needs to be filling this information out, not us. We get in trouble in paragraph number three, advising the seller on which box to check. Um, and then we get into more trouble when the seller says, uh, you know, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, I want check 4B. They check 4B and now they got to fill out the social security number. So, you know, we, we, we don't like that. Uh, we try to avoid it if we can. But again, everybody's situation is different. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, I would say that uh, you need to be talking to your seller while they're filling the form out so they don't do it incorrectly. And there's my FERPTA. Um, otherwise, we, uh, we, if we don't have that, we have the QS, the Qualified Substitute. Dude, somebody's going to have the seller's social security number. That's the law. Um, and the original FERPTA form uh, that goes back quite some time required the seller to put their social security number on there. And then we just did everything we could to try to somehow protect the seller from the buyer uh, errantly using that social security number for identity theft or something like that. All of this, of course, coming out of California. Um, and then uh, I have, I mentioned it earlier, our seller's listing information checklist, which I think is a really cool form. Um, uh, and, and in fact, if you're not using it, you should consider using it. Uh, and here's why. When I go to my uh, seller listing information checklist, it asks some really important questions like um, title to the properties or anybody else that has an interest, not just those that are on title, right? Uh, what about my loans and obligation? Are you delinquent on anything? Is there a notice of default filed? Okay, again, remember my uh, uh, civil code uh, 1695 says that it's actually a crime to write an offer under certain circumstances, residential one to four, seller is occupying the property, buyer is not going to occupy the property, otherwise known as an equity purchaser, and there's a notice of default filed against it, it's a crime to write the offer. So, uh, you know, we have a form for that, the NODPA, a statutory form uh, or a form that we have created to get around that requirement. Uh, and uh, I always get a FERP to sell or substitute from escrow. That's fine as long as you have something. Because remember, the, the question's a good one. Remember, you are in the food chain for people that are liable if the seller takes off with the money and doesn't pay the taxes. The buyer is one of the first people in there. So, you know, you're like number 26 or something. I'm not sure where, but, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to have to take the heat if the seller takes off with the uh, proceeds. Um, and so title wants this information. Escrow wants this information. Good question. Um, let me see here. What else? Ever, anything else in there? Any IRS tax liens or anything like that? Um, again, HOA, we need all that information. It may not be in the listing. 
Is there a tenant in the property? Uh, definitely. Anytime you take a listing on a property that has a tenant in it, always get the tenant estoppel certificate signed by the tenant and the owner of the property. Um, you need, you're going to need that at transfer because remember at the transfer, the purchase agreement calls the TOPA in. If the buyer's agent doesn't provide it, the seller is required by contract to provide it. And, and in that TOPA is the TEC form, the tenant estoppel certificate. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for that. Square footage. Do you like what the county said about how much your square footage is? It's still the number one litigated issue against real estate agents for some strange reason. Um, I, I sold a property in Del Mar where the uh, property, uh, the, the tax record showed it had 1,300 square feet. The property, um, uh, the tax, uh, the uh, appraiser went out and it had 1,800 square feet. And believe it or not, the buyer was contemplating litigation over the larger size property. You know, it's like, really? You got more property than you thought you were going to get? Well, it turns out it wasn't that it wasn't permitted. It's just that the county never recorded the changes. So they weren't getting the taxes on it either. So, uh, um, and again, I don't know what happened after that, whether or not the county was notified of it, but uh, um, special showing, are there any pets? Um, all of my listings that have dogs on them, I'm sorry, I love dogs, um, more so than other creatures of God, as we say, um, but dogs will bite. And so I always put in my listing, dog will bite. And so even if it's the, the calmest little thing, all I need is the three-year-old to antagonize the dog and get bit on the face or something, and then we're all going to court. So, uh, um, you know, I always put that in my listing. So it's a good thing to probably have is that is that slick form, okay? Um, seller property questionnaire addendum, again, my TDS, then my SPQ, then my SPQA. Um, and in all fairness, I am going to pull up the SPQA because uh, I, I think uh, it's a great form. It really is. Came out of San Diego. Um, there's a seller property questionnaire. Where's the, my addendum? There's my addendum. Um, again, again, all three forms side by side. I want the TDS first, then my SPQ, and then my SPQA only fixes the things that the SPQ didn't cover. So like, for example, SPQ question number five, and I, my hat's off to the attorneys on the committee for putting this together because you know there's nothing to say about uh, seller property questionnaire paragraph number five because they covered it. Nothing in six, nothing in seven. But when we get into eight, we got some stuff we want to talk about. And that's all that the SPQA does is cover the stuff that the SPQ did not uh, finish off, so to speak. All right. And uh, notice my, uh, where did it go? I had my revision date right in front of me there and I passed it. January of 23, we just put this together again. Okay. Again, prior to me getting booted off the committee. I say that with love, right? So it's okay. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, back to my uh, PowerPoint, uh, the above are the hottest items in your disclosure list. Obviously, there are more issues, um, and we'll go deep into those on Tuesday. Uh, and I do want to thank you for joining us. I, I really do for our discussion about all about disclosures. Are there any questions about any of the topical material that we covered today? I know I hit you with a lot of stuff. It's really important. Um, but uh, uh, are there any questions? Uh, anybody? Oops, got, got a live one. All right. Um, thank you, Dolly. Thank you. Um, um, any other questions? Anybody have anything for the good of the order? Anything anybody wants to cover? Um, so Jody, you're going to love this. Look at this. So we have, um, we have a new YouTube website. Um, get your QR code reader ready. So if you have it on your phone, if you've got that QR code thing, I just learned how to do this about a month ago. So I'm very excited about, my, about what I've done. So here's the QR code. All right. So if you click on that or you, you, you point your camera at it, it takes you to the YouTube website. I'm loading all my videos up there so that you have them. Uh, I haven't figured out how to put a firewall in front of it. I know the DRE is reading them um, or watching them, um, which is good. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. Hopefully they'll help me out if I make a mistake on something. Um, um, there's also you can also type into your browser at Burke Real Estate Consultants, Inc., and that will take you there. Um, you can also use the bit.ly link, something else I discovered how to do when I was creating the other, the, uh, the uh, uh, QR code, bit.ly forward slash real hyphen estate hyphen ed. And the reason why we've created all this is because we the DRE requires us to have a form to give you a form to complete in order to get into the class that I'll be teaching. And so, um, so uh, this link will take you to that. We're already setting it up on the website. Um, and then um, please remember when you go to the YouTube um, to uh, do me a favor. And if you wouldn't 
mind terribly, uh, uh, like and subscribe. Uh, can you put your contact information? Yes, I will in just one second. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for asking. Um, so like and subscribe. I don't get any points out of it or anything like that. But when I upload the new video, you'll get notified that there's a new video. And so every time somebody does, and then they send me an email and they say, oh my God, I subscribed. I love it. And uh, thank you so much for that. I, I'm just honored. Um, there's so much going on in our industry and there's no reason for, for us to all get in trouble for this, uh, you know, for things that are just easy enough to fix. Okay. So again, my place in life, I believe is to help you with that. Um, SDR is constantly looking for new opportunities, other things to teach. Um, so if you have any suggestions, you can send them an email or you can send me an email, copy them or vice versa, whatever. Um, but they want to help you. They, we have a, not only do we have a committee, but we have a department and the department has a budget. And so we want to help. Okay. Uh, we, uh, I use myself in the collective. I don't work there, but uh, um, they want to help. So uh, here's my email address. My weekly con uh, email uh, goes out. It'll go out tomorrow night about 1130. Um, and, uh, and I don't put people on it unless you ask to be put on it. At some point, I'll pull up an example of it so I can show you. But essentially, this way you bypass the, the, um, uh, you know, the message that says the class is sold out. I want you in the class. So you will never be sold out as far as I'm concerned. I want you in the class. Now I say that and I'm a little worried that when I do the RPA that uh, that is potentially going to sell out. And so, uh, you know, I know my my good friend Ed Estes, uh, who's a real estate attorney, I think no longer, I think he just, uh, he just finally, after what, 40 years of practicing law, gave up his bar and decided that he just wanted to retire. He's Superman. Uh, whenever he does a class, it's always full to the brim. And uh, I like to think that I'm somewhere close to that, but uh, certainly a great friend and, and uh, a very accomplished attorney. And I'm hoping I can talk him into writing some books. So uh, anyway, but there's there's my uh, uh, email address. And again, I've got uppercase K, uppercase B. Um, case is not important. Um, in the bit.ly link, it is. But in the uh, in the uh, email address, it's not important. I do that only so that it separates the words out so you can understand why it says what it says. So um, I'm rounding up on four o'clock. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, you all know that even though the webinar may be over, I'm not over. Please reach out to me if I can help you in any way, uh, any way, shape, or form. I'm happy to help, uh, and uh, and I want to thank you all. If there uh, aren't any other uh, questions, thank you, Joe. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, then uh, I'm going to uh, thank you for being here. Remember what I always say: if you look good, you make me look good. I really do want you to look good. Okay, it's kind of important. All right, it's important to me, and so. Um, uh, as we say from my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you around the track. Thank you, everybody. Take care for now. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.